John chapter 21. Let us hear from God's word. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called twin, Nathaniel from Ca Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We are coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciples, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast. Jesus told them, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. So Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them. The one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, who is the one that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, Jesus said to, he, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? If I want him to remain until I come, Jesus answered, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So this rumor spread to the brothers and sisters that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not tell him that he would not die, but if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is a disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which, if every one of them were written down, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. 
This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? My name's Scott. If we haven't met yet, Scott, like Scotland, but I have two T's and I own no land, so just Scott. Um, my wife and I, Angela's here with me, uh, are joining you this morning uh, across from Dubai. So I serve as a pastor at Redeemer Church in Dubai. Uh, so if you're ever there in Dubai, please come and visit us. Uh, we would love to see you, and uh, but we more than that also just love you. Uh, so I bring you greetings from Redeemer Church of Dubai. It's been our joy to walk with Redeemer Fellowship here in Kuwait uh, through prayer and through uh, visiting uh, over the years, and so I love coming to Kuwait. Um, and I hope that you love being in Kuwait. Uh, this is a particular place that the Lord has providentially put you, and I'm sure there's days where that's more of a joy than others. Um, but that's true anywhere, isn't it? And I think one of the great things of, about when the gospel starts to take hold of your heart and to change you, we become people of redemptive possibility. We start to look around in our world in a different way. And that's one of my joys is not only being a pastor at Redeemer, but have the opportunity to travel a bit in the region and visit some of the church planting efforts going on. I was recently in Oman. And Oman's a challenging place uh, for church planting. It's a challenging place for churches. Uh, but I was so blessed talking with one brother there uh, who was talking about the challenges of Oman, how they don't have, the, they can't do what we're doing right now in Oman. Uh, but yet that brother was talking about, you know what, Oman is a place where when there's conflict in the region, the governments gather and they make peace. And he was just saying, what if the gospel would spread here in Oman? And that peace bringing would be come about not because of governments using the right words, but because the Prince of Peace is lifted high from Oman. What kind of change could come in the region? And I thought, wow, that is some redemptive possibility, hopeful thinking. But isn't that the kind of Lord we serve? And then to hear, even this morning, just chatting with someone uh, before the service started about the challenges of Kuwait, that you never know one day to the next what might be happening. And that brother's saying, you know what, this is a great place for Christians because we get to walk by faith every day. And we encounter the cracks in the brokenness of society, and we have the opportunity to bring the love of Christ into those occasions every day. So what a great thing uh, to see that the Lord is bringing that sort of redemptive possibility outlook even to this church. So thank you for welcoming me here this morning. Uh, our task is John 21, and that's what we're going to be looking at. A lot of verses, uh, but we have a long time. So we're going to spend it here in John 21. It's a fascinating chapter. Let me pray for us uh, before we uh, jump into the God's Word together. Let's pray. Our Lord, we want to pause before uh, we look to your word and hear thoughts from it to say, Lord, the change that we're seeking will only happen by the power of your spirit, not by my words of persuasion. So we're asking, Lord, now for you to open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word about our Lord Jesus Christ. And even in the moment here as we do that, would you transform us, Lord? Would you convict us of sin? Would you help us see the hope that we have in the risen Lord Jesus and the life that he calls us to? We ask these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. Well, as we come into this chapter today, I want to begin by inviting you to think of the most shameful thing that you've ever done. I want you to think of the most shameful thing you've ever done. Perhaps a particular event comes to mind. Or maybe it's not an event, but a, a pattern of behavior over a particular period of time in your life. Perhaps that, that time even continues now. Perhaps a time where you thought you were right, but you look back now and realize you were so, so wrong. Or perhaps a time where um, something that was hidden became public, or perhaps something that's yet to be known, but known only to you. And whatever that thing is, whether you're young or old, we all have moments like that in our life. We all have that thing even. Does anything come to mind for you? 
Well, we're just going to put that to the side for the moment. So with that uh, very pleasant introduction, we're going to put that here for a second, and we're going to come back to it in a little bit. It was about uh, over a year ago that Redeemer Fellowship was planted officially. After many years of, of buildup, of different gatherings coming together, multiply Kuwait and different occasions, different hotels you were meeting in before you arrived at this gloriously boomerang-shaped room um, that the Lord has brought you to. December 2021, if I'm not mistaken, Redeemer Fellowship officially uh, began gathering as a covenant church body. Praise God for that. And began a study in the book of John, an expositional study. You determined as a church to expose God's Word, to expose what was in it, to hold it out for open examination, to say, we're not going to bring our own ideas, we're not going to bring our own perspectives, we're not going to read the the popular literature of the day and try and summarize it in slightly Christian vocabulary, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and see what He would have to say to us. So in doing that, you've now spent dozens of weeks Dozens of times just like this, just looking in the book of John and seeing what God would say to you. And I trust, knowing your elders, that shortly after this week, namely next Sunday, you're just going to start doing the same thing again. You'll go to another book and start seeing what God's Word says to you, and I praise God for that. Because the reliable testimony of Scripture is unchanged throughout all the fluctuations of life. That's why it's so important for us to study God's Word in this manner. And as we're looking at this chapter, this concluding chapter of the book of John, even if you've not been here for all of the dozens of sermons in the book of John, I'm going to spend some time looking back as well, so you'll get some of the themes in the book of John, but we are coming to the conclusion. And if you know some of the other Gospels, you know that oftentimes some of the other Gospels conclude after they've told of Jesus' life, they've told of his work, they've told of his death and his resurrection, and his, then his calling to his disciples because he is ascending into heaven to one day come again. But before he ascends into heaven, he leaves his disciples with some parting words. And Matthew 28, perhaps, is the most explicit and most famous when he commissions his disciples, telling them, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them, teaching them, all I have have commanded you, and I will be with you to the end of the age. Well, John doesn't end with that sort of a commissioning, mission statement sort of sending out of the disciples. We saw back in chapter 20, if you were there, that he said, he did commission them. He said, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. So just as the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit in eternity past, in the wisdom that God had in and of Himself, determined to send according to the Father's providential will, and the Son gladly uh, going in, to send the Son into the world, Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of the world, just as God the Father sent the Son, so now God, the Trinity, the triune God, was sending the disciples and the power of Jesus' name to the world. Can you imagine that? That's true for you now. That is true for you now. Just as the disciples were sent, friends, so are you sent. Just with the same authority that the Father sent the Son, you are sent to Kuwait. So there is this commissioning There is this sending out. But what John does in John 21 is rather than, again, give that sort of specific teaching, that mission statement that you can put on the wall, the way John ends is in this narrative. He ends in this story. And as he ends in this story, what we see is this powerful, powerful shape of the commissioned life. The commissioned life. In this this chapter, it really breaks out into two main sections. In verses 1 to 14, there's a story. And then in verses 15 and to the end, there's a more personal and intimate uh, conversation. We're going to spend nearly all of the time on that second section, but we can't miss the first part. The first part might be a, a story you would have seen if you had read children's books. It's pretty well known. And as you heard it read just there, that Jesus, it says, revealed himself to his disciples again. 
And then that's bookended after verse 1. It's bookended in verse 14 that now this was the third time that Jesus revealed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So with that bookending the narrative, what we have is a story of Jesus revealing himself. Okay? How does he do that? Well, Jesus is by the sea. Uh, He's there, and the disciples, not knowing he was there, go fishing in the night. They don't catch any fish. But then Jesus is on the shore, and as the sun rises and they see that there's a man there on the, the shore, he, they, they call, he calls out to them. They have not caught any fish. He tells them to fish on the right side of the boat. They catch fish. And Simon Peter, so Simon Peter is the key character in this story mentioned several times from verses 1 to 14. So Simon Peter uh, is there And he sees that it's the Lord. He puts his garment on. He jumps in. He goes straight to the water, straight to the water, straight to the shore. And what they see there, and when the disciples come in the boat later, is they see Jesus serving breakfast. Jesus has a charcoal fire, it says, and he's making breakfast, and he serves them breakfast. And they know that it's him. See there in in verse uh, 12, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew who it was the Lord. So here's this this nice story, nice story of Jesus, the resurrected Lord, appearing to his disciples and serving them breakfast. And if we were reading it sort of in a casual way, maybe we're in our year in the Bible plan and we're trying to read quickly so we can uh, get to the next uh, thing in our day, we might miss some of the drama of this. Because it would almost seem like John, in, in from verses 1 to 14, is sort of putting on the, the seatbelt sign, and he's bringing his narrative flight to a landing. It would end really nicely, wouldn't it have? Just a nice story of the third time Jesus being raised from the dead. We know that when things are repeated three times, it's a sign of completion. It's a sign of, of emphasis. So is Peter doing that? Is he sort of bringing it to a conclusion? Well, just sort of like, I don't know if you've ever seen a a Marvel movie. Don't raise your hand. I don't know if there's any sensitivities about that. Um, But if you've ever seen a Marvel movie, my kids tell me this, okay? Um, Is in a Marvel movie, the movie sort of ends. Okay, come on. You know what a Marvel movie is, right? Like all these superheroes and all that. I'm not, yeah, okay. And uh, Avengers, all that. And so the movie ends. But then what are you supposed to do? Do Are you supposed to get up and leave the theater? No, why not? There is a scene after the credits. So you have to wait till after the credits, and then there's a scene that's going to tease you for the next movie. The, and it's usually sort of the best scene of the movie. You have to wait till after the credits. And so John is kind of doing the same thing here, where the, it's kind of coming into completion. But then if we were listening carefully in that story, we would have been thinking, wait a second, there's more here. There's something you're not telling us, John, and he doesn't disappoint. We get the final scene. We get the final scene, and that's what's happening in verses 15 to the end. And let me just tell you, since uh, for sake of time, I won't do a quiz, but here's the things that would have piqued our interest if we were reading closely. Here at the end of John 21, in this story of the third, the third revelation of Jesus, There's a few things there that would have made us say, John, please tell us a bit more. One would have been the main character. It's Simon Peter. Simon Peter. He's the the main character in this story from verses 1 to 14. And as we would have known if you guys were uh, here in the earlier sermon, Simon Peter had a very inglorious final interaction um, with Christ before his death. Simon Peter denied Christ three times. Simon Peter, he said, Lord, I will, I will go with you, Lord. Lord, I will be the one. And he was the one who denied the Lord. Now, do you remember, if you were here when John 18 was preached, do you remember where Simon Peter was when he denied the Lord? He was around a charcoal fire. If you were to do a 
vocabulary word search in the Bible, not just limiting yourself to the book of John, you would find there are two times in the entire Greek New Testament where this particular term of a charcoal fire is used. One is here in John 21, and the other is in John 18. It was there around a charcoal fire that this same Simon Peter was questioned three times. Don't, aren't you one of the ones that are with Jesus? Aren't, I, I think I saw you with Jesus. And Simon Peter said three times, I don't know the man. I don't know who he is. I, who are you talking about? Not me. And here, around a charcoal fire, Jesus is serving him breakfast welcoming him with hospitality, inviting him to relive what would have at that point been his most traumatic experience. So now John tells the story of what happens next because we want to know. We want to know what happens next. Okay, what was going on in that discussion? Did it just end there? Or did Simon Peter and Jesus get to talk about it? And they did, and they do, and we have that here in these verses. So in these sort of remaining minutes, I'm going to look at verses 15 to the end and under three headings. So if you're a note taker, or if you're just trying to keep track of time, under three headings, loving the singular Lord, submitting to the double call, and living with a triple grief. Okay, single, double, triple Loving the singular Lord, submitting to the double call, living with a triple grief. And what we're looking at here in these verses, let's talk about loving the singular Lord. What do I mean by that? The singular Lord. Well, in these verses, verses 15 to the end that were read for us, what we're seeing there, but really through the entire book of John, as you think back, Throughout the entire book of John, what we're seeing here is this theme of the love of God for us. The love of God for us. What is the most famous verse in all of John's gospel? John 3.16, isn't it? What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. And that verse is famous for a reason, not just because it's clear and concise, but because it's also the theme of John's gospel, and indeed you could say the theme of Scripture, but how impactful that what is on Jesus' mind and what's on John's mind to conclude his gospel with here in chapter 21 is this idea of love. And it's not so much Jesus asking Peter, Peter, do you know that I love you? Jesus has more than shown that, hasn't he? At this point, he has shown his love by laying down his life for his friends. But now he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And the third time, do you love me? You know, some preachers or, or writers have, have built some different thinking on these verses. And I don't know how many Greek students we have here today. I know there's some GTS students. So maybe you've got your Greek New Testaments and you're, you're monitoring the sermon from that perspective. Uh, but there are different words for love used here. Um, Jesus is using the word agapao or phileo, different words for love. And some preachers have built some importance around that. Uh, but really, most commentators would say it, it's not important to do that. These words are really just interchangeable, and they're interchangeable throughout the, the work, uh, John's gospel. It's just a style. The point is not are these different kinds of love? Are these, is Jesus trying to escalate the love? Like, do you love me? Do you really love me? Do you absolutely love me? He's just saying, Peter, do you love me? It's very simple, actually. The threefold question is just a way of putting the bold and the italics and the underline on the question. Do you love me? The final verse of this section, verse 25, if you want to bounce there, says, there was many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's the person that is asking Peter, do you love me? A person of whom it can be said, 
There's no way to know all of what he did and the impact of all of what he accomplished. If we were to put it in all of the books in all of the world, there's absolutely no way to fathom the greatness of this person. He's singular. Do you love him? Let's just let our minds drift for a few moments back across John's gospel. You guys have been in this series. You've heard a lot about Jesus over these weeks. And do you remember the, the beginning of John's gospel? Do you remember how it began? That the author looked not just back to Jesus' genealogical history, his father and then his father's father and his ancestors, which some of the other gospels do, which is very important and helpful that we have that historical record. But John goes even further back. He goes to eternity. And John reminds us back in John chapter 1 that the Word in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And even before the beginning, Jesus was from eternity past, and He had now come to make God known. And then throughout the Gospel of John, John notes repeatedly that Jesus fulfills prophecies from the Old Testament made hundreds of years previously. Jesus was the one prophesied in the Old Testament. He was the one they were expecting. John records his miracles in his, his supernatural power. We read of, or you would have heard of, the, the water turning to wine in Cana in chapter 2. The healing of an official son in Capernaum in chapter 4. And the healing of an invalid in Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda in chapter 5. Chapter 6, the feeding of 5,000. Jesus heals a blind man in chapter 9. He raises Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. This is no ordinary man. John is not trying to tell us, hey, hey look, Jesus is a good teacher, and he's really, he's really likable. Do you love him? No, Jesus is saying, look, guys, this is the eternal God, the miraculous, miracle-working, supernatural, all-powerful Fulfillment of prophecy, God. Not only did Jesus fulfill prophecies and miracles, but John gives us no less than 15 names for Jesus throughout the 21 chapters of his gospel. Let me just give you a few. Jesus is God. Again, John chapter 1, verse 1. Jesus is the Word. John chapter 1, verse 14. He's the Lamb of God. John 1, 29. He's the Messiah. John 1.41, Jesus is the Savior of the world, John 4.42, Jesus is the bread of life, John 6.35, Jesus is the light of the world, John 8.12, Jesus is the good shepherd, we read about some bad shepherds in Ezekiel 34, Jesus is the good shepherd, John 10.11, Jesus is the resurrection and the life, John 11.25, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14.6. So you see, John's trying to help us see something here about Jesus. He, he fulfilled prophecy. He performed miracles. He was glorified in his sacrificial death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. And this Jesus now stands before Peter with the simple question, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love God? And not, and not just in a general way that you, you love the idea of an all-powerful being that makes sense of things for the world, but do you love God for who he has revealed himself to be in Jesus Christ? You know, a good friend of mine, Angel and I used to live in India. We lived in Delhi, and a friend, Shivanshu, he came to faith in Christ because he was sitting at a park, and someone sat down next to him and just said, hey, do you know that God loves you? And he had never heard that before. Nobody had ever told him, nobody had ever invited him to think that there was a God in the universe who not only created the world and put it into motion, but that actually cared about Shivanshu and actually loved him. And not only that, had proven and shown that love by sending the Savior. So friend, do you, do you know that God loves you? And then do you know that the the return on that, the welcome is your love. Unrestrained emotion, total trust, wide open arms of welcome. 
John Calvin said, No man will steadily persevere in the discharge of his ministry unless the love of Christ shall reign in his heart. Now that's the love of Christ, Christ's love to us, but it's also the love of Christ. So perhaps you come from a religious background or even a so-called Christian background, but you were never invited to consider that Jesus Christ, the loving Lord of the entire universe, invites you to love him. If you don't know the answer to that question, if you don't know if you love God, well, friend, today could be that day. The invitation to love is the invitation to relationship. I encourage you to love him. Now, John also gives us some shape to that. What would that look like then? You might be asking yourself, well, how do I know if I love Jesus? I think I do. I'm coming to church, aren't I? What would it look like to love Jesus? Especially some of you kids or youth, maybe you're asking that question. Your parents have told you to love, love God, but what does that look like? Well, John gives us some shape to that. And then this is what I'm calling submitting to the double call. Submitting to the double call because not only are we to love this singular Lord, but we're to submit to this double call. Because Jesus tells Peter here, and, and John throws through, shows throughout his gospel, that we are to do two things. One is to follow him, Jesus, and the other is to feed his sheep. There's this twin pairing of, of being and doing. It's a helpful summation of the, the commissioned life. And why am I using the word submit? Well, because this here is not optional. Jesus is not presenting an, an optional idea that, hey, this, this would be one way that you could love me if you have time. But what he's saying is, do you love me? This is the way that you could see that played out in your life. John 14, 15 makes it even more explicit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. See, love is not the same as obedience, but if you love, you will obey. And we can't get that order out of whack. If we think that we'll find some loving feelings just because we obey enough, ultimately that's not true. Ultimately, our obedience only comes from an awareness of our love and the love that we have experienced from God. Now, sometimes those emotions won't be there. Sometimes you won't feel like doing the right thing. But we know that the obedience that pleases God only comes from the love that we have received in Him. If we love Him, we will keep His commandments. Now, let's look at how we see that here in this text, though. In John 21, again, Peter is, or Jesus is asking Peter these questions, but then He's responding to Peter with these commands. Look in verse 19. Verse 19, after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Verse 22, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is it that you, what is that to you, follow me? So Jesus is saying to him, after each of these interactions of this, do you love me? And then he says, follow me. And then Peter is asking him, about, what about this other disciple? And Jesus says, don't worry about that, you follow me. The command is clear, follow me. And this has been consistent straight throughout the Gospel of John. If you remember back to John chapter 1, what did he say to Philip? Follow me. In John 8, Jesus speaks uh, to the disciples and he says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John 10, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And the same thing again in John 10, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. You see, there's this idea of following, just like following a lamp in the darkness, following a shepherd to the pasture. If we are looking to him, if we are loving him, there will be a posture of trust and a posture of dedication to him. You know, in these thoughts from John 8 and John 10, 
they culminate in John 12, where Jesus expands on that, of what it means to follow him. Do you remember these verses from John 12? It really contrasts a love for the world. Jesus says this in John 12, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Following Jesus means nothing less than, by comparison, hating your life in this world. Now, that doesn't mean that we get uh, overly... Uh, you know, masochistic. We, we don't start flagellating ourselves. We, we don't just say we hate life in this world and, and just become people that live in sackcloth and ashes. No. God has given us the gift of happiness. He's given us the, the joy of relationships. There are times of weeping. There are times of rejoicing. But what Jesus is saying here is, if this world is all that there is, we are most to be pitied, as Paul would later say. We, we, by comparison with our love for Christ and our desire to follow Him, we hate our life in this world. How can we know that we love Jesus? By following in His example to die to ourselves. To die to ourselves and to serve others. Think of a few of these ways. We can follow Him by dying to our preferences for the sake of others' joy in progress in Christ. Maybe you would rather have breakfast with a friend, but they're only free after dinner. Can you die to that preference for the sake of encouraging them over that time together? We can follow Jesus by dying to our need for fulfillment in earthly relationships and instead serve others. Maybe that person that you're available to spend time with, maybe they come from an industry or a background, or an ethnicity that doesn't help elevate your social status if you spend time with them. Maybe there's no earthly purpose to be relationally connected with them. It doesn't give you any wasta. Are you willing to die to your sense of need for fulfillment in earthly relationships and serve? How about one more? Are we willing to follow Jesus in dying to our reputations, in dying to our reputations and being willing to suffer insult and accusation and offense to follow him. You see, he modeled for us all of these things. He did not associate with the high, but he associated with the lowly. He did not hold to himself all that he was entitled to, but he died to his preferences or what he could out of love for us. And he became like a man, Philippians 2 tells us, of no reputation. Of no reputation to the point of being killed unjustly. Friend, are you willing to follow Jesus in that sort of way? In Peter's case here in these verses, Jesus makes no secret that that following Jesus will lead to Peter's physical death. That's what he tells him here in these verses. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you did not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Okay, Peter, here's your, here's your uh, job description. Here's your offer. Here's your contract offer follow me. You're going to die. You wouldn't take that contract if that's what the company in Kuwait offered you. You wouldn't take that. You wouldn't even move to Dubai for that contract. That doesn't make sense. Why is Peter going to do that? Well, he's going to do that because loving Jesus means following him even when it costs him his life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was killed for his faith, a German theologian. He was killed, and he wrote this before he died. If we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions and partings will it demand? To answer this question, we shall have to go to him, for only he knows the answer. Only Jesus Christ, 
who bids us follow him knows the journey's end. But we do know that it will be a road of boundless mercy. Discipleship means joy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would find the culmination of that. That journey's end for him was a violent death. But he was confident in Christ who knew the journey's end, so informed the road with joy. Follow me, Peter. And to all of us, follow Jesus. But remember I said it's a double call. It's following, but it's also this idea of feeding. You saw that there in the verses. Feeding. Jesus is asking Peter this question. Again, those three questions. Do you you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter uh, says, yes, he loves Jesus. And then Jesus replies, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. See that there in those verses? It's sort of, again, almost uh, enigmatic. It's, it's, It's complex. Jesus, what are you trying to say here? What's going on with lambs and sheep and, and tending and feeding? Is there something that we're, we're supposed to sort of Rubik's Cube our way into seeing the clarity? And the, and the idea is, again, just the simplicity of it. What Jesus is getting at is as he is the good shepherd, Ezekiel 34, again, as we read, talked about these wicked shepherds. And in that passage, the Lord asked the shepherds, shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? you remember that verse or you can see it there in your bulletins? The question that's posed, shouldn't shepherds feed their flock? A very logical question. But yet those shepherds back in the Old Testament, they weren't feeding the flock. They were feeding their, themselves from the flock. They were taking from those that were listening to them. They were taking. They were taking reputation. They were taking power. They were taking food. They were taking wealth. And now Jesus wants Peter to know for certain that if he is to be his disciple, someone that follows him, Jesus' disciples are going to go about it in a different way. They're not in it to win it. They're not in it to get from their sheep. They're in it to feed and to tend and to give. And Jesus, again, is at the model here. He is the shepherd who has laid down his life for his sheep. He is the one who has given them all things. And notice the kind of shape that we should think of this feeding. Is this just like a a general tea and biscuits? And that's what it means to feed? No. Remember chapter 6. Again, I'm calling upon your memory from all of these different sermons. But in Jesus 6, I mean in Jesus 6, in John 6, Jesus was talking about feeding, and he said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. So when Jesus says in John 21, then feed my sheep, we understand what he means. Give them Christ. I don't think that's mixing metaphors. I think that's following the teaching of John. That Jesus conceives of himself as the sustenance that the sheep need. They need him, not just nice words, not just repeating portions of his teaching, but they need to know Christ. They need to know him and come to understand who he is and what he has done for them, his truth. He is the bread of life. He says to the woman at the well that if she drinks of him, she'll never thirst again. This is the kind of sustenance that must flow from the shepherds to the sheep. This kind of feeding, the life-giving nutrition of the truth. So, good elders are those that feed the sheep. Peter loves this metaphor. He brings it up in 1 Peter 5 again, the idea of shepherds. And he calls the elders to shepherd the flock of God. And shepherds teach Shepherds lead you to the truth. If the elders here at Redeemer Fellowship stop teaching you the truth, then you should stop being a member at Redeemer Fellowship. Because you should only be in a church where the elders and the shepherds are feeding you with the truth. 
When you come here on a Sunday, what, what day is it? Friday morning. We changed the weekend in Dubai, okay? I think that was the first time I actually made the mistake to call it a Sunday. Um, we, we, did, we do that. Uh, so Friday, here we are on Friday. You come here on a Friday, and you don't leave full, then you should say, man, I'm, I'm still hungry. I'm still hungry for the truth. I didn't get a good meal today. Now, I don't think that's the case here at Redeemer Fellowship. Before I, I even said a word, you were already being fed by the music, the songs that were, were proclaiming truths from God's Word. You were being fed by the reading of Scripture, the public reading of Scripture. You are being fed by prayers that pointed us to promises of God and then to look at the Scriptures together. Friend, be at a church. Be here at this church and encourage others to be at churches where the truth is what is being fed. But is this only for pastors? I don't think so. If you read Ephesians chapter 4, who are the ones that are supposed to speak the truth so that the whole body builds itself up together in love? The whole body. The whole body. Jesus has given many gifts to his church. Some are teachers. Some are evangelists. But all are called to speak the truth in love. So friend, you are called to speak the truth. You are called to feed these sheep that you're around. Titus 2 calls older women to teach the younger. And as I've already mentioned in Matthew's Great Commission, all the disciples are called to teach all that has been commanded. So what if Redeemer Fellowship was a teaching church? A teaching church where when someone was around for a while and you asked them, hey, what's something you've learned from uh, being here at Redeemer Fellowship? They would be just as likely to tell you something that a, a member told them than one of the pastors. I think that would be a sign of tremendous maturity in this church where the truths that are being spoken of, where the gossip that's going out is the truth. We're gossiping the gospel. We're saying, hey, have you heard about this? I've got some good news. Hey, I was, I was reading in this passage. Have you, have you ever considered that? A really practical way that you can do this is next time you're meeting with someone from Redeemer Fellowship, from the church, well, I'm sure you could do this with anybody, but uh, next time you're going to meet with someone, have someone over for dinner, meet them for coffee, have a lunch together, or even just a phone call, spend five minutes. Spend five minutes thinking, is there any passage of Scripture or promise of God that I could share with this person during this conversation? Just put it on your, get your timer out, five minutes. Just spend five minutes thinking and praying. Now, you might get into that conversation and it just doesn't come up. And it just, it wasn't, it wasn't suited for the conversation. Um, and that's fine. But that kind of simple intentionality to say, what, what of the Bible can I bring to my daily conversations over time will change the culture and the course of not only your life, but the church. Friend, be a teaching member of a teaching church because if that happens, the sheep will be fed. The sheep will be fed with Christ. So you see this double calling, to follow and to feed. Some people try to only do the following. They don't want to speak into anybody else's life. What I, like the things I was just saying, that sounds really awkward and really uh, not fun. Uh, you don't want to be a religious authority in anyone's life. You just want to be a private follower, part of Jesus' secret service. Nobody knows who you are. Come in, go out. Happy to sit in sermon after sermon, listen to podcast after podcast. There's a phrase Paul uses for this kind of people. They're always learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And some of us, on the other side, we aren't so good at the following thing, but we love to feed. We love to open our mouths, and we love to tell others what they should have learned from the sermon on Friday. Like, oh yeah, I hope that that person was listening. They really needed to hear that. Well, this is called boastfulness and proud. We have the appearance of godliness, but we're denying its power. We go on and on about the theology and church. Or if you're from a different religious tradition, 
I'm sure this is true for you perhaps as well. You know many, many things about your religious traditions, the festivals, the gods, the narratives. But at the end of the day, there's no following. There's no Jesus. There's no love. There's no relationship. And you see, ours is a double call. We lay down our lives to follow Christ. And we see the lives around us and we give them Christ. We lay down our lives to follow Christ, see the lives around us and give them Christ. We follow and we feed. It's a double call. So lastly, loving the singular Lord, submitting to the double call. Lastly, we come to know Again, about Peter around this charcoal fire. Let's close by thinking of this triple grief. Living with a triple grief. Now now remember the background of these three questions, as I mentioned earlier, is this charcoal fire. In John 18, Peter had denied Christ three times. In that series of denials that Peter committed, as devastating as they were, they They had actually even been predicted in John 13. And on the night of Jesus' betrayal, Peter and Jesus talked about this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you'll follow me afterwards. And Peter said to him, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, you will lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. So Peter boldly says to Jesus, Peter, uh, Jesus, send me in. I'm your guy. I'll do the, the life laying down stuff. Leave it with me. And Jesus says no. And then while Jesus is laying down his life, Peter denies him. Imagine Just imagine with me the weight of shame that Peter would have experienced when he comes out of the water and he sees Jesus standing there next to a charcoal fire. You know, perhaps after the last two appearances of Christ, so this was the third one, so maybe after the first two appearances, maybe Peter has started to think, oh, okay, that that whole like denial stuff, that's, that's just water under the bridge. You know, Jesus, maybe, maybe Jesus didn't hear me say that around that fire that night. He was busy with other stuff. Maybe Jesus didn't remember. Maybe we're just not going to talk about it. That's how a lot of us deal with shame, isn't it? I'm just not going to talk about it. Maybe, maybe they don't know. I'll just, I'll just go to a different church. I'll just move to a different city. I'll just never see that family member again. We're just not going to talk about it. It's uncomfortable. It makes me sad. It's hard. Because life is hard, isn't it? Whether it's the sins we've committed or the sins committed against us, life has these shameful moments. Our stories have these shameful occurrences. But Jesus loves Peter too much to not enter into his place of deepest shame. So as the scene plays out, just like at the charcoal fire where Peter was asked the question three times if he was a follower of Christ, Jesus now asked Peter the question three times. Do you love me? Did you notice in the verses, after the third time, it says that Peter was grieved. Peter was grieved because he said this the third time. Christ literally replaying the scene, reenacting the sin, so that Peter can see that the love of Christ is going to be Peter's fuel for his mission. You see, Peter thought that following Jesus meant accomplishing the mission on his own. Peter's saying, I'm going to lay down my life for you, Christ. Peter's saying there, I'm the one who's going to do this. Jesus, watch me. I got it. He needed to learn that no, Jesus has it. Jesus is the one 
who will lay down his life for his friends. And Peter only could understand that through the providential working of God through this story. The story moves on from Christ to Peter asking this question, and they see John standing there nearby. So it sort of continues this interaction. And having just heard from Jesus the kind of death he would die, uh, Peter, again, looks to his side and sees John there and says, what, what about this guy? I'm going to die. What about, what about John? What's his contract say? And Jesus isn't going to play this, this game of comparison. Verse 22, he says, If it's my will till he remain, if he remains till I come, what's that to you? You follow me. And in this conversation, Jesus is totally reorienting how Peter's going to live in this world of grief. Is not going to be living with shame hidden in the background. And it's not going to be how he measures up with other people. Does he have the same access as other people? Does he have the same privileges as other people? How is Jesus, or how is Peter, I'm sorry, going to live in this world? He's going to follow Christ. So friend, it's just obvious for you the then simple invitation to consider that. What if, what if for you, as you thought about that shameful occurrence, that shameful thing, what if I, what if I brought it right here? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a, a thing. Maybe it's a scene. What if it was right here? And you thought, you walked in the door, you saw it there, and you thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to talk about that today. You see, Jesus is saying that, friend, that thing is not just the place where you can feel his forgiveness and his love most powerfully, but it's the place that can actually be the source of your calling and your part in his mission to the world. You finding redemption in the most shameful parts of your history can be the fuel that will send you on the mission for Christ in his will. So when you see that shameful thing, do you hear, hide me? Or do you hear the invitation, follow me? You see, the thing is saying, hide me. Don't talk about it. Leave it under the rug. Jesus is saying, follow me. He knows, friend. He knows you. He knows your story. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your frame. He knows your shame. And he's calling to you to follow him. What a Savior. What a Lord. So, friend, love Christ. Love him. Love this Savior. Submit to his calling. Follow him. Feed his sheep. You know, David says in Psalm 51, Restore to me the joy of salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Our following carries with it this call to teach the sheep. As we see the forgiveness of our sin, we teach transgressors his ways. And then, friends, bear your grief. Live with this world of grief, not hiding it, exposing it, finding Christ and his love there, even in your most painful places.